and uh, and welcome to Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts, the culture cast caught at the crossroads of curation and castration. I'm your host, Ben. And I'm your host, Kurt. And I th- there's a bug inside of <laughs> the plastic on your window, <laughs> and that's... I I saw it just as the music was starting to <laughs> was starting to fade out, and I had to do the intro, and it freaked me out a little bit. This old house, yeah, yeah, it's full of bugs, it's full of bugs, <laughs> full of bugs, full of worms. Hey, speaking of Cloverfield paradox, <laughs> right? How fucking fast! As soon as as soon as that weird thing happened with the Russian guy's eye, I was like, he's full of worms. <laughs> I knew it. Once that piece of data was in place and someone was like, where'd all the worms go? It's like, that guy's full of worms. That guy's definitely filled with the worms that we can't find. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, how you doing, Kurt? Uh, I'm good. I made a new friend. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, the bug in the wall? No. Th- I don't like him. He's, <laughs> He's if, behind you. If he weren't behind me, he would already be dead. Oh. Um, I, I started... I've been jonesing for Animal Crossing lately, mm. and I can't, I can't quite figure out the best way to scratch that itch because my my 3ds is essentially broken. There are like two buttons on it that don't work, which is pretty <laughs> crippling in most games. Mm. And uh, I started playing the GameCube one last week, but I was just like, man, you know, if you it's can't, so old. It's it's old, but the really the. The killer is that there's just no online capability. So if you don't have like two or like one or two other people to play with you really you're so limited by what you can do but then i was on reddit and i saw i think somebody posted to one of the the more dead animal crossing subreddits it might have specifically been the city folk subreddit Hmm. but somebody was like hey i've never played city folk and i just bought it and i want to have some people to play with and i messaged them and i was like you know what I'll fucking start up a city folk file and uh, we can be friends. So I have like a 21st century pen pal via <laughs> and we, via Animal Crossing. We're still in the setting up stages, so it might not ever pan out, but I started a file on it today just in case they want to touch base. Mm-hmm. My town has pears growing in it. so That's a pretty good fruit. That's my least favorite fruit. Yeah. So if it mm-hmm. didn't take so long to start a new file, I probably would do it until I got anything but pears just keep rolling until you get oranges or yeah any of the other i'm like peaches are meh but (laughs) you know your apples your oranges yep yep your cherries cherries all great is there is there just the equal chance of getting any of those or is there a rare fruit you know i i i I believe it's equal but i do think i get pears more often it's just because you hate them you remember the times that you get pears. confirmation bias yeah so yeah it's probably even yeah (laughs) How are you? I'm good. Good. Yeah. Uh, everybody's doing good. Excellent. Family. Perfect. The baby. Everybody's good. Um, yeah. What are, but this this week, I got to revisit a film. Yeah. That I haven't seen in a while. <laughs> yeah. It's a little movie made by a director named David Lynch. It's a little movie called Blue Velvet. I got to experience this film for the first time. I was real curious to find out what you were going to think of this one. Last night. So... I watched it last night. Last night I watched it. I, I just said that like in three it's segmented okay. ways. Yeah. <laughs> so last night I watched Blue Velvet. Mm-hmm. Yesterday afternoon I went to pick it up at my local store that I buy things at. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I want to walk you through my my thought process with Blue Velvet. I went to the store. I grabbed it. This is it. And Very tastefully erotic cover. I, I knew... That I'm not a huge fan of Kyle MacLachlan. Mm. And then I saw his soft, supple, white, shirtless body on the cover of it. <laughs> yeah. And I said, this is probably not something I'm going to enjoy. And then I read the back of it, which I won't read the whole thing. But the first sentence is, Beneath the surface of small town serenity lies a dark domain where innocence dare not tread and unpredictability is the norm. It is the haunting realm of blue velvet. And I'm like, I'm probably not going to like this. So I watched it while Laura went to her dance uh, lesson last night. And she came back and she was like, how's your movie? And I said, not very good. <laughs> and then I started to fear that I haven't seen most of David Lynch's work, but I just really like Eraserhead. And I was just like, 
what if I just don't like David Lynch movies? What if I'm just committed to this podcast like idea and I just don't like any of his movies? Oh, I love this. Except I happen to like the first one. <laughs> so, with that information, yep. I was in my car at 5 a.m. this morning doing my research before work. <laughs> yeah. And I was reading about it and getting outside context about the movie made me like it. I noticed some of the things that I read about. I did not notice others. So with all the information that I picked up from it, I feel like I like this movie that I did not like yesterday, which I have not watched again since I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of in a weird a weird spot with, with Blue Velvet where I think I like it, but I almost think maybe for me the stuff that's like, it's like, similar kind of to how I feel about um, The Hateful Eight where mm-hmm. there's so much cool stuff about it that I, I tell myself I like it more than I do because like the, the movie itself isn't really what I like it's all the context around the movie uh, it's in- it's really interesting that uh, that you make a Tarantino comparison because there are a lot of Tarantino comparisons floating around David Lynch's career in the commentary about David Lynch especially early David Lynch uh, the writer David Foster Wallace said in 1996 that Tarantino was kind of a Lynch like imitator. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Which is an interesting thing. To they're both kind of they they both have these uh, destructuralized takes on genre that uh, that apparently a lot of people drew parallels between at the time, and, and you can see a lot of uh, a lot of Lynch influence on the early films of Quentin Tarantino. Um. What was some of the contextual information that you found out that you really enjoyed? One of the things that I enjoyed so much was last week we had talked about where David Lynch would be when he made this movie because he got to make his eraser head and then he was like, I'm going to make a, a quote unquote real movie. A normal then, movie. A normal movie. And then everybody was like, oh, you were really good at that. You, you know, if you want to be a director for hire, we'll give you big movies like Dune. Yeah. And you had said that it seemed like David Lynch was probably very stressed out and not enjoying himself while making Dune. And as I was reading, it turns out that was pretty much exactly the case. And Mm. uh, he went to pitch a movie idea to somebody, and they didn't like the idea, so they asked him if he had any other ideas, and he pitched one aspect of Blue Velvet, which I believe was the idea of a young boy sneaking into a woman's bedroom to watch her change (laughs) and then seeing like a crime or being, you know, becoming privy to a crime scene. And he wanted to make the movie so badly. He did it for like significantly less half. I think they cut cut the budget and his salary in half. It was made for like $6 million, which is pretty fucking good for a two hour, like real movie, like a movie with (laughs) a bunch of locations and sets and characters and stuff. Yeah, it's pretty good. So I thought that was really cool, and I now kind of understand the importance of the film after, like, reading about it and stuff. Nothing else had been like this yeah. at that point. That was pretty... So sort of like Eraserhead, right? Yeah. Like, that, that movie turned the cinematic world upside down. Blue Velvet did kind of the same thing. Uh, it was very divisive at the time as yeah, well. Yeah, I also saw that. Yeah, Roger Ebert gave it a one-star review. <laughs> I did not know that. seems to have considered it, like, a... A, a really bad movie, not just it technically, but morally. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting that you bring up morals because I I don't know much about the the American culture of that time, but I know that the the violence and sexuality themes in this movie are pretty pretty hardcore for what the rest of the movie is. This just like kind of neo noir film. So I think maybe in that context of seeing this movie, like, you might have to say you didn't like it, because (laughs) maybe back then, letting on that you liked a movie like this, maybe people thought that it would make them weird if they allowed Mm. themselves to like a movie like this. But kind of similar to Eraserhead, the fact that it wasn't super popular, but gained this, like, underground cult following really did more to help it i think if it didn't have those themes and it didn't have that cult following 
it would have just been like a pretty good movie from that year that was forgot about the next year when that summer's movies came out or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very challenging film. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't maybe present very well right up front, but it, it is quite deep in terms of all the things that make it seem really strange and alien. The first time you watch it all contribute to this wholly separate alternate reality sensibility. Uh, and, and that I think makes it a very strong shower in the long run. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So what's blue velvet about? You tell me, having seen it one time, Curtis, what's Blue Velvet about? <laughs> well, a young man, played by Kyle MacLachlan, moves Brilli- back. Brilliantly played. Brilliantly let's, played. Let's make, sure that we, let's make sure that we get all the qualifiers in there. Brilliantly played by beautiful, just hunk of man meat, delightful <laughs> Kyle MacLachlan. He's incredible in this movie. And I will say, to his, to his strengths... I, I read a little bit about why David Lynch likes him so much, and that kind of gave me like a, oh, okay. And it's the same kind of a deal in, in Twin Peaks. He kind of does the same thing where he's this like kind of an outsider innocence that can't help but be curious about these you know bad things that are going on, and he goes into this dark, seedy place <laughs> where most people wouldn't want to go, and David Lynch said that he was a good person to go on that journey with. And I agree with that. I think that that almost like that made me enjoy Blue Velvet a little bit more and I think I'm interested to see if I go continue to watch Twin Peaks if that will affect how I feel about Twin Peaks. I have heard that uh, his character in Blue Velvet is something of a precursor to his character in Twin Peaks, which is something weird that happens in David Lynch movies is that you have these character archetypes that show up throughout the different films, but they're not quite like the normal psychological archetypes. They're they're a little bit skewed. Well, I think that maybe what goes on in David Lynch's mind is we've talked about how he is an artist that just uses filmmaking as a means of, you know, delivering an idea rather than wanting to be a big filmmaker. I almost think like maybe he just keeps using these same characters and like character types because he just doesn't care. Like he, he's making this movie for this reason and doesn't really care about, you know, the aspects of making a movie that don't interest him. So well, it's like he has a cast of characters in his head and they kind of <laughs> get plugged into different stories and he's like, "All right, well, in this one, the the archetypal investigator is he finds an ear and then he sneaks into a woman's bedroom. Now in this one, the archetypal investigator is from the FBI and he's investigating the death of a young girl, right? And they kind of get put into these different situations, but the characters have something fundamentally in common. It's one of the cool things about David Lynch. One of the many <laughs> cool the, things. One of the many great things about American filmmaker. Yeah. 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 So this character returns to his <laughs> hometown of Lumberton. Lumberton. Best, best town name. It is Lumberton. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, because his father has a stroke. Yeah. And uh, after visiting him in the hospital, he's walking home through a field. He finds a human ear in the field rotten moldy yeah, human ear ants all over it yeah brings it to a detective who tells him that he'll work on it but don't <laughs> really fucking paper, paper bag, bag. <laughs> but kind of tells him to just like you know we'll take care of it don't think about this anymore when we solve the whole case someday i'll tell you you mm-hmm. know everything about it but until then you can't tell anybody about it basically dangling the yeah. ear in front of <laughs> kyle mclaughlin being like don't think about this anymore uh and so as he leaves really not happy with what he was told about leaving it alone the sheriff's or detective's daughter shows up and she was like hey i hear a lot of stuff in my bedroom i think i know something connected to this which kind of teams them up and sets them off on this journey to figure out where this ear belonged to and the the seedy underground what happens at night in lumberton which Mm. is masked by a beautiful idyllic american no, uh, Americana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of a setting that could be anywhere from the 50s through the 70s or yep. 80s, probably. One of the things that I immediately noticed that I thought was super cool was this movie did feel like you said it would, where we 
peel a couple branches back from that David Lynch tree, and it feels much more like a natural successor to Eraserhead yeah. than Elephant Man and then Dune and then this. And it was really cool because it it had a a lot of eraser heady type feeling and shots in it, but with color this time. Yes. So you really got to see how David Lynch utilizes color. His, the whole that that's probably the biggest innovation in this film, and clearly the thing that David Lynch thought the most about, right? Like it, it's in the title. You know, yeah. blue velvet. You already know from that title, like you're you're gonna think about a texture and you're gonna think about a color, and those are gonna be central things to the film. And his use of color is extraordinary from the very beginning of the film. The 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 first shot in in the film, it you open up with this just ideal, super happy, colorized, leave it to beaver type town, like a dream, like a dreamscape yeah. of a town. And the the th- first three colors in the first shot are red, white, and blue. It yeah. pans down from a bright blue cloudless sky with a white picket fence and then red roses underneath that. So you, you immediately open up to this red, white, and blue America. Yeah. And I thought that was like really, really cool because the colors almost were like where it was this dream feeling. The colors were almost like so saturated that they were like too beautiful to even be real. It was mm-hmm. very hazy and dreamlike and that was a really cool like i instantly i was like okay i i like this already more than i was worried about liking it and <laughs> yeah the rest of the movie was kind of the fire truck with the dog the man yeah. on the fire <laughs> the truck waving. waving at nobody in slow motion <laughs> he's waving at you he's, <laughs> he's welcoming welcome you into to lumberton dream. yeah so Can- candy colored clown they call the sandman yeah man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there so this movie's pretty weird. <laughs> it definitely keeps... It's not paced like a normal movie. And I almost think that was one of the things that I felt was like a flaw in mm. it. I think David Lynch took two hours to tell a story that nowadays would be like wrapped up in like a 40-minute NCIS episode. Oh, like, like, I know like that's barf. probably... That's I'm barfing too, that's, forever. That, that's too far, I think. <laughs> Because that takes away from the other great things, but as far as like a neo noir detective story, you don't need two hours to tell that story. But you do need two hours to tell a psychosexual erotic deconstruction of uh, the detective story. All right, you do need that sure, time. Sure. Because if you tried to cut this down to 40 minutes, someone would say you can't have a 25 minute erotic scene. <laughs> Where he get he goes in the closet and then he's out of the closet and then he's in the closet again. You can't do that. But get undressed. I want to see. You. That, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's an incredible scene. And and the the scene of um. So I, as far as I'm concerned, there are two set pieces that make Blue Velvet what it is. It's the scene in uh in Valens's apartment where Kyle MacLachlan is being kind of a voyeur, right? Mm-hmm. And then that's where we meet Frank as well. And then it's the scene where Frank takes, uh, takes fucking, what's his name? Jeffrey, right? Jeffrey takes Jeffrey on a joyride yeah. to Ben's place. Oh, we got to go to Ben's place. <laughs> you ever been to pussy heaven? <laughs> he said, no, I gotta, I gotta say once far- again, Brad Dourif putting in a great performance <laughs> as uh, what's I forget what his name is. Similar to in Dune, I did not know that S- Dean Stockwell would become one of David Lynch's, like, character pieces. And as a guy who grew up just watching and adoring Quantum Leap, I don't like seeing <laughs> Dean Stockwell doing all this weird stuff. I just, as a 30-year-old man, I was not prepared to see good old Al from the future with his little Tetris computer. Yep. You know, dressed as, like... Fine. Luther. Here, <laughs> Here's to your fuck. <laughs> It was a little. It was definitely amped up from Dune, but he was still pretty strange in Dune as well. Who was he in Dune? I don't remember. But I, I don't remember he was either. In there. And I was like, "Hey, it's hey. Al!" <laughs> I had to look up his name because uh, I don't remember. You just remember Al. I just remember Al. That's <laughs> he is Al to me. He's from. He's fifty percent of Quantum Leap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so um, those are the two centerpieces of the movie for me, <laughs> and the rest of it kind of whirls around that. Yeah, I you know, I think my favorite scene in the movie was I, I can't remember her her name 
what's the, the main woman's name? Valens, Dorothy Valens, or uh, the, Sandy. Sandy, and I can't even remember Kyle McLaughlin's name. Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Jeffrey uh, something. Yeah. So know. when Jeffrey and Sandy are in the bar for the first time watching her sing the slow club blue velvet everything slows down in it, there. Uh, that was one of my favorite scenes in the movie i think there was some really nice chemistry between those two as they were friends that were finding out they wanted to be more than friends beaumont jeffrey beaumont jeffrey beaumont yeah <laughs> good name david lynch it is it is so one of the things that i liked a lot in that scene too was i i don't know much about like beer culture but I do know that there are a lot more microbrews now than there were in the 80s when this was made or, mm. um, so I really liked how they used the, the Heineken bit to like separate like Jeffrey from this he's like he's like so like charming like man Heineken man I love Heineken I just love Heineken <laughs> and I think back then probably for what was available in like a small leave it to beaver town mm. Heineken was probably the only import beer that you could drink and it was probably weird to drink it because it <laughs> it made you an outsider mm. and then her dad she's like my dad drinks bud yeah. and he like king of beers yeah like just weirdly like <laughs> Longingly, the king of beers. Yeah, he just recites the <laughs> the ad slogan for Bud. <laughs> and I think that that was that was cool because it showed that he drinks something that other people don't drink, something that makes him different. And then she throws in his face, "I'm used to this the American this way," and he longingly is like, "Yeah." I guess you would be. You get the feeling fucking Jeffrey started drinking Heineken at college. Yeah. <laughs> to be Honestly, cool. Honestly, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, Heineken. I just love Heineken. I love going out to the bar at night and getting a good cold Heineken. And then you have later in the film, so you have Heineken up here, and then Budweiser a little bit below yeah. it, and then later Frank comes in and he's like, PBR! <laughs> Pat, Heineken, fuck that shit. <laughs> and he just goes for that bottom shelf, the dirty cheap beer. Mm-hmm. Nothing against PBR, those who drink PBR. There's nothing I hate more than warm beer. Makes me puke. (laughs) (laughs) So I really like how they use those different styles of beer to really just like, just show these these characters. It It establishes a a hierarchy. Developed them. Yeah. I I thought that was, that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, that that is pretty good. Um, This movie is Dennis Hopper's best performance. It... What? He's pretty good in Apocalypse Now too. Yeah. Not not the second Apocalypse Now film, but Apocalypse Now as well. <laughs> the Apocalypse Now too. The sequel to Apocalypse Now. Yeah. Um yeah. He Frank though. What do you think of Frank? That was crazy. I mean, it was pretty intense to see him. I, it was just it showed that the David Lynch like over the top character that's like injected into the scene which I think you kind of see a little bit in Eraserhead I mean like you have certain characters like Henry Spencer that everything is so subtle every movement that Jack Nance made in that film was carefully thought out and rehearsed everything was on purpose everything had to be mostly red on his face all these looks of concern and uneasiness and then you had characters like uh mary x's dad who is just this weird yokely over the top completely you know opposite to henry spencer and i really liked it was kind of those same archetypes in this he just played this completely over the top crazy just wild character that apparently uh Dennis Hopper called him and was like, I need to do, I need to be Frank. Yeah, he specifically said that, which is a terrifying idea <laughs> because Frank is the devil. <laughs> the fact that you would. Uh, Frank like is an actual demon. <laughs> I've been waiting for the opportunity to play myself. This is me. I, don't, I want to touch seen... them. I want to pinch them. <laughs> Have you ever seen Easy Rider? Yeah. I've never seen it. It's a great fucking movie. So I, I'm interested in seeing like the Dennis Hopper and then from what I read on like Wikipedia I think maybe somewhere else this kind of revitalized Dennis Hopper's career so I would like to see where it started now that I've seen like 
This is what you got to do to stay relevant. Mm-hmm. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but Frank also has moments of incredible subtlety in the film. Mm. Um, for instance, when he... Two, two moments pop out at me. One moment is when Jeffrey is watching Dorothy... Sorry, I'm going to cough real quick. <clears throat> Where Jeffrey is watching Dorothy in the slow club for, I think, the second time perform Blue Velvet. And he looks over and he sees Frank sitting in the audience clutching the, that Blue Velvet yeah. tie... And just, like, watching her, and I believe he's mouthing the words along with her, and he looks completely consumed by pathos. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's a it's a moment of just utter, maybe not even despair, but, like, you, you get the feeling that this is a, a, an incredibly emotional moment for him for reasons that he can't even describe. And a similar moment to that is at the very end of the joyride, when, uh, when Jeffrey speaks up and tries to defend Dorothy against... Frank's advances and Frank has his whole speech about like don't you be a good neighbor to her I'll send you a love letter fucker yeah <laughs> you know what a love letter is it's a bullet from a fucking gun <laughs> you really get good. a love you get a love letter from me you're fucked forever <laughs> one of one of my favorite little monologues in the whole movie um it's so uh, it's so esoteric uh but he as he's saying he puts lipstick all over his yeah. face and then kisses give, gives Jeffrey a bunch of smooches all over his mouth and then he he says the words to the Roy Orbison song in dreams along with the song while it's playing and it's another moment of real subtlety you, like, you get a lot of moments of animalistic rage from Frank in this film including that shot of what I believe is probably like Jeffrey's dream about Frank after his first encounter that's just Frank in like choppy slow motion screaming yeah <laughs> and it's a great shot that's that sums the character up is he's nothing but rage uh and hatred maybe not even hatred maybe just rage just undirected rage uh but in in that moment outside of the car with the woman dancing to in yeah. dreams on top of the car <laughs> while uh, Jeffrey's getting the shit kicked out of him. That's yeah. Just a very... That's another great example of that, like, David Lynch nightmare scene where none of this makes sense, but it's somehow very scary. It feels... Everything like, feels like it's in the right place <laughs> to make me scared. Uh, but as he's as he's saying the, the words to In Dreams, so like, what does he say? In Dreams, I walk with you. In Dreams, I talk to you. Right, he has that that delivery. He has that same a, a look of uh, of determination on his face that he needs to get across to Jeffrey how important it is that he not fuck with this, <laughs> that he not interfere in this situation that he has going on with Dorothy, that he not try to that he not try to uh, save Dorothy from the underworld that she has fallen into. Frank wants to hold her there. He's trying to he's trying to maintain his grip on her. Great a lot of great stuff with Frank. Frank is a, a real interesting character. I think the the biggest thing with Frank that stuck out for me was seeing his first encounter with Dorothy when he has his weird sexual Yeah, he starts out as daddy and then yeah, turns into the baby once he huffs the gas. Interesting going back as a character going back and forth, you you are full of this like anger, and you're just but you're still going back from back and forth from wanting to be a baby that gets dominated to the father, which exerts control over everything. And I thought that, that was a very very scary because you you just no in no way can you expect anything to happen because you have ne- I'd like I've never seen anything like this and I've seen some <laughs> shit like I've watched some movies in my life and like I I'm like what is going on like this is scary and hilarious it is at the inc- same time it is incredibly shocking and, there's uh, no way even, it's it's amazing that something filmed in the 80s can still be shocking today yeah. but that that scene with Frank and honestly Frank as a character still is successfully so shocking that like 
if you try to recommend Blue Velvet to some, it's it's like a racer head, honestly. Like yeah. if you try to recommend a racer head to someone, you're like, you, you kind of have to be careful who you recommend yeah. it to. There's, it's the same with Blue Velvet. There's some stuff in this movie. Here's but, some. Like, are you gonna want to be in like a good space emotionally? Yeah. You're gonna want to have a good distance between you and a complete breakdown because yeah. Blue Velvet might just take you over that line if you watch it in the wrong mindset. Yeah. Um. What else do we have here? I, I'm looking, looking at my shitty ass notes. Um, in one way that you can tell the budget was cut was the shitty effects in this movie. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Tell me more. <laughs> tell you more about the shitty effects? Yeah. Name one. Uh, we, we will start with the any of the like the body doubles when they get shot in the head that look like a soccer ball with a face painted on it (laughs) with like fucking ketchup pouring out of it it's an awesome effect those were really really bad it's really good and then um the bird don't fucking talk to me about this bird all right the The, bird is on purpose the bird puppet (laughs) do you know the story behind that bird i don't know they wanted to have real robins for that scene at the end it's a very important it kind of connects back to uh to sandy's prophecy at the midpoint of the film um, and it's kind of a core piece of like the pessimistic religious undertones of this movie. Um, but I, I, at least I interpret it as pessimistic overall, not pessimistic. I don't know, but they wanted to have real Robins. The animal handler didn't like, did not come through the Robins that the animal handler brought were fucking molting and looked <laughs> terrible. Right. So what had happened was someone on the, on the film, I believe on the, on the crew of the film, had hit a robin with their truck right and had it taxidermied so that robin at the end is a taxidermied puppet being operated by wires by david lynch himself okay and it's the perfect ending to the movie it's absolutely right because the rest of that scene is so it's (laughs) like a it, it brings you back once you exit so a very important structural part of this film, and I don't know if it, I didn't notice it until like the last time I watched this movie, uh, is that you enter the moldy ear, yeah, right, and then you exit Kyle MacLachlan's <laughs> ear. That was one of the things I noticed when it went into the ear that it was very hard. I won't say it like beat you over the head with its importance, but. It felt that was one of the most eraser head feeling things. It's a bizarre moment. So it it really stuck out as a, there was like that tonal humming and it just like yeah. zoomed way too far. It draws your attention ear. to it. You're going into the tunnel. You're entering the subconscious of the town, right? Yeah. And then you exit Kyle McLaughlin's ear back into the the town of the beginning of the movie, the very first shots. This idyllic, everything's in kind of a softly lit, beautiful fifties glow to it. And then, like, everybody's happy. Like, oh, Jeffrey's dad is fine now. He just needed to... He just needed to rest. He just needed to rest for a couple days. He's fine. Uh, Sandy and Jeffrey have, like, a thing going. Jeffrey is dressed in in bright clothes, which is unusual for him in the rest of the movie. But there's this one piece of dissonance, and it's this weird fucking bird (laughs) with a bug in its mouth, just, like, bopping around. Hi, hi guys. Hi, guys. I'm a bird. I found lunch. And then Aunt Barbara says, like, I could, I could never eat a bug. That's disgusting. Yeah. And fucking, you, they repeat the shots from the very beginning of the movie and credits, and you're left to wonder, like, what was that? No, man. What was the ending of that movie? I, I know the ending of that movie. Okay, this tell is, me. This is my interpretation. Mm-hmm. So, in the beginning of the movie, after, uh, his, after Jeffrey's dad has the stroke, there's that weird shot where it pans like underground and you see all the beetles like, yeah. you know writhing around and it's gross and scary I think that is you know it's it's the underground of the city it's showing that when it, when it gets dark a bunch of weird gross seedy things happen in this town and then after the the, the was it Robins is that what they are? yeah the Robins after the Robins come and everything is better like they said it would be he's eating a bug and then um, Francis Bay, our Barbara, is like, <laughs> I, don't, I couldn't eat bugs. And I think she is saying, I wouldn't have had the strength to fight what I know is there. 
and then that's a moment for Jeffrey to be like, man, we we did fight those bugs. Like, <laughs> we ate we, that we bug. We ate that bug. That bug is gone now. <laughs> and then you get to see Dorothy play with her little son, and then it just happy ending. Mm-hmm. But I really liked that. Like that bird was fucking whack, but <laughs> <laughs> that bird rules. <laughs> That real bird was whack. And but. yes, you're you're right. I forgot to mention that Dorothy is playing with her son. So that is the optimistic half of the movie, of the ending. But in I, my I really liked the that she went out of her way to say, like, I could never eat bugs. Because on its own, it seems so weird. Like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> like, but in that context of that, you, you know, Jeffrey just yeah. has his, like, we ate the bugs. Uh-huh. Like, I, I liked that. So I like this movie now. I didn't like it the last time I watched it. Why didn't you like it? I I think I was mostly... I didn't notice the significance of all of the imagery. A lot of it jumped out at me, but I did miss a lot of it, including when I saw the end and that was like... The thing with about the bugs was so strong that it kind of like hit me of a lot of the other bug symbols throughout the movie and then I was reading about it this morning and I had more pointed out to me that I had not noticed like you know the the man was called the man in the yellow jacket and mm-hmm. I was like oh I know like what a, yellow jackets yeah. are and I had read one thing that was saying that Frank's mask made him look like insect like when he was breathing in his mask and hmm. I hadn't thought about that because the whole I was so mystified by it anyway that I, <laughs> I hadn't been able to think about what it might mean or represent. Um, but it, it, I do feel weird because when I watched it, I really think it kind of boiled down to two hours felt like a really long time to have happen what did. And I think that if I watched it again, I probably would like it more having just some of the stuff I read about it. So, yeah, I don't know. I liked it now <laughs> I I think on this podcast especially in the David Lynch series uh, I think I have to by the end of the podcast I have to have the opposite feeling about the movie you know what do you mean like I, I really liked uh, Elephant Man and then the more we talked about it I was like yeah this movie's okay <laughs> I wouldn't call it essential viewing yeah I'll probably never watch it again uh. <laughs> and I, I didn't like Blue Velvet but now I'm like you know what I just I wasn't smart enough for a... the, I, I didn't get all of it now that I under, now that I've had a lot more of the stuff in the movie pointed out as important, I'm like, you know what? I'm totally on board with this now. Blue Velvet is hard to have watched once. Yeah, that's that's also fair. Yeah, it doesn't it it like you if you can watch it once and be mystified by it, but I don't think I think watching it once is a good way to get like a baseline. Like, all right, I kind of understand what happens in this movie. Yeah. Now I need to try to figure out <laughs> what it means, what any of it means. I was, I I thought it was bold when I had started because each one of these movies that we've reviewed, I've bought on like DVD or Eraserhead. I have on Blu-ray, but I bought them on DVD. And after watching this, I was like, should I be buying all of these because I don't like Blue Velvet and I don't think I'll ever watch Elephant Man again. Curtis, I can tell you. Probably don't buy the rest of them. <laughs> well, right? I don't think I'm De- going to. Definitely don't buy Inland Empire. <laughs> I don't think I will because I, w- I was saying to you before we started recording, Blue Velvet is the last cheap one. <laughs> every every David Lynch movie after this is like, I think the cheapest one was like $10 and the most expensive one was like 30 mm-hmm. It's like, I don't mind dropping 5 bucks on a movie I might never watch again pre-owned yeah. copy of Blue Velvet. Mm-hmm. If I never watch it again, big deal. But, yeah. you know, when it gets into, like, this is $15. Like, that's that's real money to me. That's my income bracket. Yeah. $5 is, like, fun money. Don't worry about what happens to it. $15 is, like, yeah, that's, like, a that's a chunk of grocery money, like, <laughs> for yeah. a, a David Lynch film that I probably won't like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they only get weirder from here. <laughs> that's good, you know? <laughs> I that's why we're on this adventure. That's why we're that's why we're doing it. That's why we're going down. I'm I'm really hoping that with this movie, which seems like, I mean, it was div- received kind of divisively. I think most people liked it, but yeah. some people really didn't like it. And I think looking back, most people are like, "Yeah, we just didn't really get it." Now mm. with the context of 
everything in it and what else David Lynch has done. This is a good movie. It was just it's a weird one. <laughs> um, I'm excited to see where we go next at, because I know we go to Nicolas Cage, and that yeah, wild is, at heart. <laughs> that's interesting because. Nicolas Cage is like a huge joke now, but like there was a time when Nicolas Cage. What are you talking about? <laughs> Nicolas Cage is not a joke. Nicolas Cage is a meme. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. A lot of shit is memes. All right, <laughs> fucking don't get me started on memes. I don't need to. I don't need to to air my grievances about memes too hard. <laughs> but yeah, no, Nicolas Cage is one of the greatest actors to have ever lived. Okay. We're gonna. This is okay. I'm not. I'm not saying he's only in good movies. I don't. Disagree I'm saying with he's that. he's never been bad in a movie. But he's been in really bad movies. But he's always good in them. I don't know. I don't know how how deep you or I A have, B C D have scraped the the Nicolas Cage barrel because i when I say he's become a meme i the things that I think of are not the bees, and the other thing is that Nicholas Cage took his entire fortune and like spent it on like t rex skulls and a hilariously stuff. <laughs> bad idea hey dude's bad with money what can, yeah, i can't you know, I can't hold that against him if I had forty eight million dollars I'd probably spend it on a fucking t rex skull I'd buy, too. A, I'd buy a couple old bones I don't know if they'd be t rex skulls but I'd buy some some ancient fucking osteos so I think you kind of have he has become one of those actors where these are very different actors and some of them are definitely better than the others, but he's... I'm thinking of actors like Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, and then the weird one kind of is like Adam Sandler. But, <laughs> like, where the first leg of their work is memorable, good movies that... That's why Adam Sandler's a little bit weird, because he's always kind of sucked a little bit, but <laughs> he was good at what he did, and the whole second half of his career, of their careers are just, like, them phoning it in and being awful caricatures of themselves. And I think with Nicolas Cage, like, I used to say, like, this was an actual conversation I had once with a friend. We were like, man, fuck Nicolas Cage. That dude sucks. And we were like, I mean, except Con Air's pretty good. And then he was like, yeah, 8mm is pretty good, too. And then we're like, hey, yeah, face off, too. And then for, like, 10 minutes, we just named, like, fucking 30 awesome Nicolas Cage movies. But that cannot help the fact that he lied on his taxes for like 20 years and now every month he's in a different shit Redbox movie. I think that really, yeah, that's really going to hinder his career. And I think to a certain extent has made him kind of a joke. You're saying when we do the Nicolas Cage series, it's going to be, it's going <laughs> it's going to be a, a long and hard road. I, you know, I never want to say never, but I really think I might draw the line in the sand. At, it might even be before Nicolas Cage filmography. <laughs> Wesley Snipes will probably... I'd probably do a Wesley Snipes filmography before I would do... I do think he was another guy that got caught lying on his taxes for I years. I made a blood oath that I would never watch Blade Trinity again, so we're not going to be able to do a Wesley <laughs> Snipes filmography. Unfortunate, uh, unfortunately, listen, I wish that we could. Wow, yeah. I wish we could, but I take my blood oath seriously. I've never seen Blade Trinity, and... I was you're like, making me want to. You're making me want to go against my blood oath here, Curtis. So before I know, I don't, Ben. I don't want you to go against your blood oath. Thank you for saying that. I've only seen part of Blade. Hmm. I've never seen Blade Two or Blade Three. <laughs> so I mean, I don't want you to go against your blood oath. Call it by its Christian title, Blade Trinity. <laughs> Blade Trinity. Uh, I do know that Triple H pedigrees him. I think is it him? He ped. Somebody gets pedigreed. I don't know what half those words mean. In Blade, uh, All I know about pedigree is dog food. Do is you know that, who Triple H is? He gets H's? turned into dog food. I do, I think, I can't picture him, but I know he's a wrestler. He is a wrestler, and he was the antagonist in Blade Trinity, mm. and he does his signature wrestling move in the movie <laughs> to somebody, uh, <laughs> which is just a dark time in American culture. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that anybody ever let that happen ooh, on a Hollywood film. Mummy series. we got to do the Mummy series because The Rock is in some of those movies. Okay. How could, the Mummy series is interesting. I'll I'll say that <laughs> because it was it started out 
fuck I really liked The Mummy like when I was yeah. I haven't seen it since I was in like middle school but I thought that movie was fucking rad I watched that movie multiple times in theaters same I was nine and uh then you, it just gets worse, and then there's a spinoff that was even worse than the bad Scorpion parts. King? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I don't know if we could do a mummy trip, <laughs> a mummy series. Maybe I'll meet in the middle and say, if we start back at, like, Universal, the mummy. Oh, yes. So and that's then... all, that's if we do the Universal, we're doing the, what we've already decided our only cinematic universe that we're going to follow is the Dark Universe. Right, I don't even know what we're talking about. What, Whatever the the the, uh, the Universal Cinematic Universe, the Universal Monster Movie Cinematic oh, Universe, yeah. the Monster Universe. I, I believe they call that the called. I believe they call it the Dark Universe, oh, or the Dark World or something. Uh, so that's what we're gonna. That's the only one we're gonna follow. And as part of following that, we have to watch all of the Universal Monster movies, all thirty five classics, and then yep. subsequent remakes and reimaginings. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Is Frankenstein part of that? Yep. So, there we go. Yep. It starts with Frankenjaws. <laughs> yeah, that's the first one. All right, next and Halloween. I think, uh, well, I, I think Dracula was the very first Universal monster movie, so we'll start, well, like, that will be the prequel, and then mm -hmm. we'll move in. We'll even get some squeakles in there. I'm really excited about all this. <laughs> well, we'll let's find every movie we can possibly because those those monsters got shoved into a lot of weird shit back <laughs> in the day. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, which is canonical, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Believe. Mary Mary Shelley's Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. <laughs> oh God, it's gonna be a. This is the dark timeline for the podcast. <laughs> this is if we really fuck up. This is the hell that we could create for ourselves if we go a bad road. Yeah. Uh, so that's the that's, me shrugging. that's, that's the underbelly. What shrugging. do you what do you think what do you think is the point of Blue Velvet? Psh, movies don't need a point. No, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that as an just as an idea in general, I really like. I really like the nighttime. I really like mm. things that are different at night. You know, I like walking around town. I, even, at a young age, I realized I like walking around town at night and seeing. Maybe it's the Legend of Zelda fan coming out in me, but I really liked seeing the differences between what a place could feel like in the daytime and the nighttime. Mm -hmm. I used to sit in my third story. I would like lay in bed in my third story bedroom. And there was a bar called Charlie's down the street from my house. And I used to yell out at drunk people when they walked by my <laughs> my bedroom window. And it was so high up with the lights out, you could never see where my voice was coming from. Mm -hmm. But I used to yell at drunk people. So I think from a very early age, I've been interested in weird shit happens at night. Yeah. And uh, normal thing, good things happen during the day. Um, so I think, I mean, that might be the, the point of making those two worlds crash together. Uh, and I think Kyle MacLachlan is a great character to do that with, a great actor to do that with, with Jeffrey. Jeffrey Beaumont. Sick name. It's Love a good that name. name. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What would you say the point of Blue Velvet is? I think it's about the problem of evil in the world. Uh, uh, Jeffrey has that has that monologue in the middle. It's, uh, it's the precursor to Sandy's description of her dream about the robins where jeffrey says why do men like frank exist why are there men like frank right yeah and that's that's the question but it's not just about frank it's about why do bad things happen sometimes for no reason but perhaps there is always a reason right perhaps it's because there's this pernicious force of evil in the world um i think that there are a lot of very tight biblical allusions in this uh i i particularly like at the beginning when uh, Jeffrey's dad has the stroke. There's that shot of the of the um, the hose twisted around the bush, which yeah. looks so much like a snake wrapped around a tree, right? And that's yeah. what that's what gives him the stroke. Is like it that that disrupts the flow of water. That just disrupt, disrupts the flow of life giving water that's into the evil world. Entering their world, evil enters the world, right? And it's it's just a mistake. It's just an accident. It's a little snag in the hose but still that's what causes all the events to to unfold after that uh yeah that's that's what i think it, it's about a journey it's jeffrey's journey into his own subconscious into the subconscious of his community to figure out why are there bad things happening 
And at the end, he seems to think that he has solved evil. But I think that's why it's a pessimistic ending. Because one bird eating one eating one little bug is not a solution yeah. to the problem of evil. It is a promise that individual problems can be solved and individual bugs can be eaten. But you can't just rest on your laurels after that, you know? You can't figure, like, well, everything's fine now. <laughs> Dad's out of the hospital. I think... Frank's dead. I think the solution... And maybe I wouldn't say it's pessimistic because the way I view it is not that Frank's dead, we did the good thing. I I think it doesn't matter whether Frank died or not. What the important thing was, was that we ventured into this dark place and pulled this good thing back out of it. We survived. And we, we pulled Dorothy and her her son out of this dark I think world. That's true. That's true. Ultimately, I I do think that the most powerful part of the ending is the fact that Dorothy is reunited with her son. The the mother child pair is is reunited, and so you get the sense that the world is going to continue in a good direction. Terrible wrongs can occur, but they can also be righted by people acting in in the nature of their best conscience. Yeah, that's I, that's overall what I think Blue Velvet is about. I really like this movie. Yeah, I, I, I'm i still just amazed at, <laughs> I was going to say amazed at myself, not like the not in the way that that sounds, but just with the context of this movie, how last night, I was like, man, I, I'm just worried I don't like David Lynch films, to like, really convincing myself that I did enjoy this movie today, and I'm, I'm looking forward to watching it again. Um, someday. Someday, <laughs> not immediately, <laughs> yeah. we get a long, we get a long David Lynch road to go down. Oh yeah. And uh, I I still think that I'm really intrigued by, you know, like I was saying about the Cloverfield Paradox, the first time you watch a movie, a lot of times it just kind of washes over you. You don't really, you aren't really able to process how you think about it because in that way, sometimes you're not a person watching a movie, you're in that story and you have to watch it a few times to be able to not get sucked into it so much to be able to, you know, really evaluate things that are happening in it yeah it's the same with any any book or any work of art is is you i think you need to experience it once to get a baseline level of understanding and then if you really want to know it and i think that if you want to talk about something in an informed way you do kind of need to know it you want to watch it again with the that full... Doesn't, that doesn't say a lot for our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you want to know, if you want to talk about it, you're really going to know about it. I will, uh, I beg nope. to differ, Ben. <laughs> I go in blind all the... I haven't watched a single David Lynch movie yet. I just read about them. <laughs> I've never even seen Eraserhead. I've not seen a frame. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's uh, Blue Velvet. I feel very good about Blue Velvet. I like the direction that David Lynch's career went after this. I, I'm excited to see where it goes. And at, walking away from Blue Velvet, I really like it, if only in that it's a story about the other side of life. I, mm-hmm. that The scary part that you you ignore, and it's very easy to ignore if you don't want to see it. I think that it, it reminded me, when they were at the club, very much of the 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 world that you know, like Tom Waits builds in Nighthawks at the diner, but not in a good way. The scary <laughs> part of yeah. the, the, you know, sad guys hanging out at the bars and nightclubs and diners by themselves. I, I but I love that world. I, I do love, I love that world. And it's nice to see the scary part of it. You frequently see the romanticized, like, Oh, this isn't the ideal way to live, but we live like this and it's pretty cool. Home is anywhere I lay my head. Yeah, I like that. And this is nice to be like, man, there's some fucked up shit in that town. <laughs> that's, that's my final thoughts. Quote me on that. There's some fucked up shit in Lumberton. Just put it on the cover of the K-K-K. Blu-ray. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what I should... I should type up a one-liner about every movie I own and then print it out and just like glue it on the back of the case. <laughs> Maybe that should be something we do about all the movies. We say like, all right, is this essential? Is this, you know, should you watch this? Should you not watch it? Also, what's our one-line take on this movie? Yep. You know, I don't know if it was on the back. Have I ever told you about the best review ever on the back of a movie? I don't know if it's on the DVD or not, but it's a quote from Roger Ebert 
Uh, it's on the back of City Slickers, and I can't remember <laughs> if it's on the back of the DVD or the VHS, but it's basically like, it's like two and a half stars, and then Roger Ebert's like, yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> like that's that's the fucking culminating line about City Slickers. And yeah, City Slickers is pretty good. <laughs> That's the best review ever put on the back of a movie. Yeah, yeah. It's probably better for your own film's prosperity to, uh, <laughs> posterity rather, to say something that's true about it rather than something that puts it in its best light that it, that may or may not be true. Yeah. Yeah. Here's my take on fucking Nicolas Cage, by the way. <laughs> okay. Here's yeah. why I think Nicolas... You didn't Nicolas, really get to defend yourself. Here's why that. I think Nicolas Cage has been memified. all right? It's because memes... And by uh, by extension, I'm gesticulating with a can of seltzer right now, yep. as though I'm Very holding court. <laughs> Memes, and by extension, our our modern condition as human beings in in the West uh, of the world, right, is that we are we are bathed in irony twenty four seven. What Nicolas Cage does is he gives a one hundred percent genuine, wholehearted performance no matter what the movie he's in. So people look at that, and there's nothing more susceptible to ironic reappropriation than pure, genuine, <laughs> the, like true performance. There's nothing easier to reappropriate ironically than Nicolas Cage with the fucking bees, right? <laughs> Which, if you look at that in terms of a five-minute rundown of Nicolas Cage's performance in the film The Wicker Man... It's like, yeah, that's hilarious. But if you look at it as a person watching an actor work, what a brave performance. <laughs> what a brave performance. He really put it out all out in the open for everyone to see on a movie that I'm sure he knew was not going to be very good. <laughs> Nicolas Cage does not go halfway on any of his movies, is what I'm saying. He goes all out. And, and we, as fucking millennials, love to take someone who puts it all out there and take a little piece of them and like, ah, I can make this funny. <laughs> It's funny that you did that. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. an internet goblin. <laughs> <laughs> I think, for a lot of ways, Nicolas Cage, he, he kind of was like, a, a, you know, just another trope that ended. That's kind of how... You, like, you have such specific, like, sub-genres of movies, like the 80s action star, your Sylvester Stallone and your Arnold Schwarzenegger... And after a while, action movies just can't... But you get to Commando, and you're like, this is the end of the line. Movies cannot... They can't be any more like this than Commando is. We gotta go another way. I think Nicolas Cage was just that great 90s action star, that, like, kind of pessimistic, like... I don't know. I, I feel like Nicolas Cage was a very 90s actor, not just in the literal sense. I think that's where he peaked. But I think that he just kind of, he portrays the 90s action star. He made the 90s action star what it is. He contributed for sure. And um, I think that it just, I think when that ended, he couldn't adapt to a new thing. And he was like, oh shit, I, not only can I not adapt, I fucking need money. <laughs> but then, hold on a second, all right, though. All right. Allow me to present Raising Arizona. <laughs> I've never seen Raising Arizona. He, Nicolas Cage is excellent in it. Let me present uh, Amos and Andrew. I've not seen it. You don't need to. <laughs> it's uh, pretty dumb. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, what are we doing next week? Wild at Heart. Wild at Heart. Is our next Nicolas Cage. featuring Nicolas Cage playing a character who is not completely unlike his character from Raising Arizona. And sort you, of you've a seen uh, Wild at Heart, not in its entirety. No, I've never, I had never even heard of it until, mm. I, until this, and then I looked it up today, and I was like, "Oh, Nicolas Cage! <laughs> wow, a '90s movie with Nicolas Cage, David Lynch. <laughs> you're making moves." <laughs> that, and I said it just like that in my head in the deli at work mm -hmm. on my phone. You know what? I think that Nicolas Cage is ideally suited to David Lynch as an actor director pair. Because David Lynch knows what to do with someone who's going to lay it all out on the line, right? Okay. He he knows. He's like, okay, I'm going to tell you to do some stuff. <laughs> You're going to take take what I say to you and elevate it. Take it farther in the direction that I tell you to take it in. So which Nicolas Cage is to David Lynch as who is to Quentin Tarantino? Hmm. Who is he in the in the Tarantino group? Which which person in the Tarantino group? 
is as complimentary to Tarantino as Nicolas Cage sounds like he's going to be to David Lynch. Oh, I don't know. Uh, John Travolta was really well suited to his role in Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Though he was kind of the he was kind of the Dennis Hopper of that film. Yeah, that's right? good. Um, as far as someone who like really understands what Tarantino wants, Tim Roth probably. Tim Roth's performances in Tarantino movies are always pretty spot on. Maybe Christoph Waltz. Yeah. He also has, and of course Samuel L. Jackson puts in puts in consistently great performances where people kind of say like. You, you, who you know he plays the same character in every Tarantino movie which is really not true uh, I don't need to get too deep into that but Uma Thurman also they really they mind melded in Pulp Fiction and in Kill Bill is that, that answers my question that answers your question that's good I didn't give it one answer I gave it a bunch of answers just kind of as they came to me you know I, I hit you with these curveballs I can't expect you haven't asked me about a random video game in a long time that. so I like just thinking that I gotta I gotta stay on my toes somehow I know you know we've we've stepped away from we've been doing a lot of the movies with the movie series I don't know if I've mentioned this on the air but I have a list of like one-off or so episodes that I'm very, very excited to do. Mm -hmm. So I know we have to get through the David Lynch series, and then I'm holding you down to do Boondock Saints 1 and 2. I forgot that that was what was going to be after the Lynch series. After. So you really better savor these movies, Ben, because... <laughs> We're going to watch a bunch of movies that I like. And uh, May You know what? Maybe I'm going to love Boondock Saints this time. I hope so. Maybe I'll find it in my heart. I remember really liking it when I was a teenager. Haven't really watched it since I was a teenager. Yeah. So I'm a pretty different guy than when I was like 16. So You're no longer so down with vigilante justice. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Let's not say anything we can't take back. So, yeah. I got some ideas. I'll Maybe I'll bounce some on you after the show. I've never heard it phrased like that before. You're going to bounce them on me? Yeah. Bounce, yeah. I say bounce them on or off. You that said bounce them on. I'll bounce them on you. I'll bounce these ideas right on your, right on your thinking noodle. <laughs> I think we're done here. <laughs> this, is, this is over. Yeah. <laughs> you have ruined this. <laughs> All right. So next week we'll be back with uh, Wild at Heart. Wild at Heart. Everybody watch it at home. Watch yeah. it twice. Let us know how you... Don't wait until the night before... And then watch it, and then not have time to watch it again, or think about how you. Feel. Oh, you did a good job, Curtis. We had a Only lot of because I came around. If we I had a lot of, you would not have been able to formulate a good argument against Blue Velvet. I don't think. Yeah, because it's a perfect movie. Oh well, okay. <laughs> Hold on. Next week we're here for another hour. Anyway, in the meantime, you can uh, you can subscribe to Black Gold Podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. You can listen to Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts on YouTube. You can follow Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts on Twitter at Ben underscore and underscore Kurt, right? Yes. Yes. That's right. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at KurtCake5K. We'll be back next week to keep talking about David Lynch. So we'll see you guys then. Bye.